everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and today we're talking about an adventure game classic from good old Lucasfilms, aka LucasArts, aka that company who did the Star Wars games, Maniac Mansion. Released in 1987, it was designed and programmed by Ron Gilbert and David Fox, with art and animation by Gary Winnick. You know how I can tell this was designed by Ron Gilbert, do you? Because of all these fucking verbs! Sorry, I get a little salty when it comes to superfluous game mechanics, I've always been more of a fan of the command prompt for these older adventure games. Maniac Mansion was conceived in 1985 by Ron and Gary, who shared a love for campy horror B-movies and silly humor, so they came up with the idea to set the story in a mansion inhabited by mutant beings with very strong chins. You will find references to B-movies all throughout the game, however it is not a horror game or scary in any way. It did used to frighten me as a kid because a mansion named Maniac didn't inspire too much joy, but it is a mostly humorous title with some creepy settings. Something I find really interesting is that it started out as a pen and paper board game. As described by David Fox, the set of the mansion served as the game's board and there were acetate overlays for the levels of the mansion and room details. I love how it was conceptualized. I attribute Maniac Mansion's solid map design to the fact that it was planned out so well in advance. It should be noted that I am playing the enhanced version of this game because I just prefer the aesthetics over the original, but somehow these characters still look like they have rubber legs. This is some weird Gumby shit right here. The plot is as follows. A group of teenagers find themselves at this huge mansion because one of the protagonist's girlfriends was kidnapped. His name is Dave and his girlfriend's name is Sandy. Sandy... Pants. Well, that just sounds uncomfortable. Why did this happen? Because she is being used as an experiment to feed this radioactive meteor that crashed near the mansion and has turned the head of the household into an evil doctor that has spent the last five years in the basement. Also, did I mention there are tentacles? We'll get to them later. So as the game starts out, you are instructed to choose your characters. Dave is chosen automatically, much to my dismay. I am not a Dave fan. You have six other kids to choose from, all fitting a specific archetype. Sid, a musician into the new wave scene. Michael, a talented photographer. Wendy, a budding novelist. Bernard, a geek. Razor, lead singer of the punk band The Scumettes. And Jeff, he's like a surfer dude. I always choose Razor for my team, and I'd like to say it's because I enjoy her puzzles a bit more, but there might be another reason for it that definitely doesn't have to do with aesthetic, and I also go with Bernard because nerds and punks just make for a really good team. I ship it. Because you can win this game using characters that solve puzzles differently due to their varying skill sets, the game is not linear, meaning you can do many things out of order and complete it in different ways, also resulting in several endings. Typically, I don't like adventure games that require the use of multiple characters at once to solve puzzles because I find it a little overwhelming, but at the very least we can get Dave captured right away and shove him in the basement. He's in charge of pushing the loose brick that opens the security door, so if one of the other kids gets locked in, there's always someone else to let them out. Unfortunately, that means one kid does have to stay down here, and for my playthrough, that person is Dave. Good luck, son. You have one job, and that's to push the brick. Don't fuck it up. Are you serious? So technically, I guess I'm only controlling two characters at a time, but if I'm honest, I try to avoid even that by only using Razor. Some puzzles do require switching back and forth, but I used her for the majority of the game. These strong-chinned characters that live in the mansion are the Edisons. Dr. Fred, who has been brainwashed due to prolonged exposure to the radioactive meteor, his very thirsty wife, Edna, and their son, Weird Ed. Weird Ed is definitely the normal one in the family. There's also dead cousin Ted. He resides in the bathtub in case you wanted to visit and pay respects. You can also call Edna for a good time. <laughs> Look, I don't blame her for having this insane libido and going all Blanche Devereaux on us. Do you realize it has been four days since I have enjoyed the company of a man? Her husband has been in the basement for five years and this woman needs to fuck something. Right, so the story of Maniac Mansion is pretty simple. Every now and then you will get a cutscene that pushes the story forward or informs you on what a character is doing, but the majority of time is spent exploring and completing inventory object puzzles. So since we've got a lot of that squared away, I will talk about the shit I love about this game and the shit I love a lot less. Living in the mansion are two talking tentacles, green tentacle and purple tentacle. Purple is a little power hungry and is on the side of Dr. Fred, and green tentacle is... a little depressed. See, he wants to start a band, but hasn't the confidence to send in his demo tape. He's the only one who hasn't tried to kill me or throw me out of the house, so I need to help him. I must protect this sensitive, fragile tentacle with every fiber of my dark punk heart. So I had Razor play and record some music for him to listen to, and he almost felt inspired, but this little darling just needs one extra push. As in, I'm just gonna send in the demo tape for him and get him a contract. 
Perfect. He vows to protect us always and follows me around like an excitable puppy. This is actually one of the ways you can beat the game, getting Green Tentacle to assist you at the end because you helped him early on. It should also be noted that his favorite food is wax fruit. He's a disembodied cognizant tentacle, so I'm not trying to judge this preference too harshly. I'm not even sure what the digestive system of a lone tentacle would even be. I also really like the design of the mansion. Even though this game has an absurd amount of backtracking, I think keeping the entire game in one location with different rooms to explore was a good idea. I especially love this risque statue. Ooh, and this mummy pen. Up. Mm. There's nothing sexier to a goth darkling than a monster pinup. As some of you know, a version came out for the Nintendo, and it went through what is now considered infamous censorship before it was approved. No sexy mummy, no risque statue, no Playboy calendar, and a lot of the dialogue was altered. Interestingly, they left the part where you can microwave Weird Ed's hamster. You confuse me, Nintendo. I'd much rather see some boobs than explode a poor innocent animal. Oh, this cute little furball. Who would do such a monstrous thing? Me, apparently. I cannot tell you how bad I felt about doing this. This may be a pixelated hamster, but I'm still human. In an act of the ultimate evil, I went back up to show Weird Ed the obliterated body of his former rodent friend, and he was so hurt and traumatized that he killed me. Honestly, that's probably the correct reaction. If you take the hamster and give it back to Weird Ed, he'll be on good terms with you. I also like the man-eating plant. He's so cute. I helped him grow using radioactive water and Pepsi so I could... Uh climb up his body to get to the attic. Yeah, that's a thing that happens. In general, there are just a lot of details about this game that create a fun, silly experience. However, I noticed that as I was replaying, I was getting increasingly frustrated at the amount of backtracking I had to do. And not always because I was getting stuck, but rather the rooms you do the most in are so far away. I started to hold a pretty massive grudge against these stairs. But most of my issues with this game, and most old school adventure games, are with the puzzles. Now I realize I'm going to sound like a hypocrite here, because how many times have I defended my love for the classic Sierra titles? The answer is too many times, but the difference is that Sierra had no shame in designing utterly ridiculous puzzles to amp up the difficulty and prolong the amount of time spent on their games. Ron Gilbert, one of the lead developers at LucasArts, has gone on record saying that even though King's Quest was an influence, he didn't like that the puzzles punished the player by being illogical. In an interview, David Fox recalled a Sierra game that punished the player for attempting to pick up a broken piece of mirror, stating, In one of those games, picking up a piece of broken mirror would kill you. You'd bleed to death. I know that in the real world, I can successfully pick up a broken piece of mirror without dying. Hey, you know what else I think I could do successfully in the real world? Open an envelope without the fear of ripping it and rendering it completely useless for a future puzzle I need to complete. I logically think that if I get an envelope in my inventory, I should be able to open it. But silly me, what was I thinking? I need to steam it open. I also loved when I logically had to come to the conclusion that the high score of an arcade game that I had to go through extreme lengths to power on is the combination to the main security door. Yeah, all my high scores are definitely my passwords, totally logical. The amount of useless inventory items can also be a bit daunting. Early on, I found myself taking broken bottles of ketchup, cheese, a head of lettuce. What the hell am I doing? Am I making a cheeseburger? Yeah, I'm being a bit of a smartass because comparatively, LucasArts has always had better and more fair puzzle design than Sierra, but they ain't perfect. I found some of these puzzles rather excruciating. This is made up for slightly by the fact that there are so many ways to complete the game, so messing up doesn't necessarily mean a dead end, but things definitely got tedious. You could also die if you're not careful, as shown with the hamster incident, and if you don't act quickly in certain situations, the entire mansion will explode. LucasArts would eventually scrap the possibility of death in future games. The company mostly stayed true to their belief in not punishing the player. At least, not too much. A pleasurable amount of punishment. It's like when you have a loose tooth and moving it around hurts, but it also kind of feels good. Yeah. That's LucasArts. One of my favorite things about Maniac Mansion is not necessarily from the game itself, but its influence on the adventure game genre. Because of this, we got to see Bernard and the Tentacles again in Day of the Tentacle, which is an outstanding title in LucasArts' catalog, and a lot of elements from Maniac Mansion are used in Ron Gilbert's spiritual successor, Thimbleweed Park. Carefully handling broken glass? If this were a Sierra online graphic adventure, I'd be dead now. 
Wow, David Fox held on to that broken glass thing for a long time. As I played LucasArts games throughout the years, I only loved them more and more. They became funnier, more refined, and the puzzle design improved. So even though Maniac Mansion is not one of my favorites, I think it is one of the most ambitious and detailed early titles, instrumental in bringing a new mechanic to adventure games, and it proved that they could be funny and a little bit naughty. Though I am a little disappointed that I couldn't turn on the statue. In 1990, Lucasfilms developed an idea for a live-acted Maniac Maniac Mansion television series that would focus on the Edison family. The rights were purchased by the Family Channel where it ran in the US and on YTV in Canada for three seasons. I'm gonna be honest, I wasn't even aware this was a thing until several years ago. I have no recollection of ever seeing it growing up. If you're expecting something to really follow the premise of the game, however, you aren't going to find it here. It strays pretty heavily. Though as a show, it was well received. It's very odd, and I couldn't quite grasp what kind of audience this was targeting. It almost comes across as a kid's program, but it has a lot of dark and subversive humor. Personally, I would have liked to see a campy Maniac Mansion cartoon based on the kids you play as. This show really doesn't resemble anything from the game. I'm not even sure it can be considered an adaptation. The only thing it has in common with the source material is its name. The Maniac Mansion 10th Anniversary Special will return after these commercial messages. Okay, final thoughts. Of course I recommend this game. It offers a lot of replayability and Green Tentacle is a treasure. Cheers to LucasArts for creating some of the coolest adventure games out there. No matter how snarky I get about the UI or the puzzles, LucasArts will always have a very special place in my heart. Don't be a tuna head. Check out Maniac Mansion. Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and I just want to thank you again for watching my video on Maniac Mansion. If you're interested in more gaming-related content, then be sure to check out my backlog because I have a shit ton of video game-related stuff. If you happen to like classic television, I also cover that. Murder, She Wrote, Goosebumps, The Golden Girls, all this and more. I very much appreciate shares and likes, but if you want to support me more directly, then consider pledging to my Patreon campaign. I have rewards like handwritten postcards, a Discord chat, and I'll also love you platonically forever if you decide to pledge. Just like Green Tentacle followed Razor around for helping him, I will do the same for you. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.